Peter Kalmus. No gas stations for him. His 1984 Mercedes runs on used vegetable oil that he gets free from a sushi restaurant. This jug will get us about 120 miles. The biodiesel engine runs on biofuel, not fossil fuel. So no. this is not contributing to CO2? No, it's a waste product. It's not contributing to climate change. Wow. It's, it's a waste product and it's coming from the atmosphere and then it's going back in the atmosphere. This is important to Peter. You see, he's an atmospheric scientist, an expert on climate change and global warming. Why isn't society doing more about this? This is the most urgent problem facing humanity. <laughs> Well, welcome. Tonight we have Dr. Peter Kalmus and I am Sandy Shellis and welcome to Environmental Coffee House, everybody. I am extremely uh, excited and happy to have my guest, Peter Kalmus. Um, you know, Peter, I read your background and I have watched you. I'm on Twitter with you every day. I feel this kinship with you especially when you talk about the the grief you know the climate grief and and also the pushback you're getting it, you must get in your career for being an outspoken nasa scientist data researcher i know you're a data researcher and again we have children so i have a 32 year old and my years are younger but i still think of if we don't change, are we going to change? What is their life going to be like? What is it going to be like? So there's a lot of things that you touch me with, and I'm very happy to have you. So thank you. Yeah, thanks. And um, I'm drinking fizzy water right now, so I hope that's okay because it's a coffee, I, I, coffee I'm, house. I'm, okay. I'm drinking water with uh, it's my homegrown. Um, I put cucumber <laughs> in my water because I have so many of them. <laughs> How many pickles yeah, I, am I going to be able to make? There was just a, I just saw an article too, I, something that, that I've been worried about for a long time, I, I think might be coming to pass because before lunch, I drink a lot of coffee and apparently, uh, you know, it is going to start getting more expensive soon and the they, they expect the quality to start going down because the growing conditions are uh, degrading because of climate change. So, I mean, that, that you know, the, fl the fires and the floods are bad. <laughs> But take away the coffee. Oh my and God! What, that's what's a left? <laughs> that's yeah, a catastrophe. Even I should though also I drink say I'm speaking, low acid, I, low caffeine. Yeah. I drink like this crazy coffee that probably no one will ever make for me again. <laughs> I should say too, I'm speaking on my own behalf here. So uh, I do, I do work at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and do climate science. But they don't. And to to touch on your point about pushback. Um, it hasn't really been that bad. Uh, you know, Good. four or five years ago, when I was a more junior scientist and I was a little less experienced at speaking out, I would get sort of afraid sometimes. And I feel like, well, can I like go that far? Can I say it, say it that directly? You know, like, well, how is that going to affect my colleagues? How is that going to affect my ability to, you know, basically maintain my career as a scientist, and not get fired, yeah. let alone getting grants and progressing oh in my God. career? getting collaborators. But now I'm, um, I'm, I'm getting uh, like a much thicker skin. And the other thing that's really changing quickly is with these recent, with the intensification of climate disasters that we're all living through right now, the rain that you guys are getting on the East Coast, the oh fires and the drought, yeah. the heat waves we're getting here on the West Coast, and everything in between the storms, the flooding in Europe, uh, the, you know, the Madagascar and um, other parts of Africa are on the brink of climate famine. So with these, this intensification, oh, wow. the public is really waking up to the fact that we are in an emergency and it's not waking up as fast as I would like it to, but that makes it a lot harder for people to say that the stuff I'm saying, I shouldn't be saying because I'm just telling the climate truth, right? And five or six years ago, people would have called that alarmist and I would have called it prescient and realistic, but now it's hard, a lot harder for people to say that what I've been saying all along is actually alarmist because it's not. It's not. And yeah. I, anybody wants to call it, it, me an alarmist, well, have at it. And right, I will exactly. show you that's, the goods. I have the receipts. Yeah. That's how, that's how I feel yeah, too. Me yeah. too. Well, <clears throat> Peter, I, I, um, I want to start just 
I know we don't have a lot of time, but I want to start just a little bit with lifestyle because I loved that one interview that I read. <laughs> I love everything about that whole video. I wish I could have played it for, for everyone with your family in it. Um, the, the, the Mercedes on the biodiesel. It's <laughs> not easy for everyone to live like you do. And people do give it a try. We are always talking in our audience about our gardens because I'm a huge grower, canner, prepper, um, all of that. And we did a video with everybody <clears throat> sent me their garden pictures. And uh, that's great. So, so tell us, how did you, how did you do it? How did well, you I'll, I'll say that life? it's a, I think it's a lot easier now than it was like in 2010 when I started going down that path. So, and I should say that, you know, the reason I did the Mercedes thing with the Veggie that that was the hardest thing I did. That was the most like technically difficult, the most time consuming, the dirtiest thing, you know, getting some vegetable oil splashed on your old yeah. jeans every now and then. So yeah. I, it, it was fun. I, I really enjoyed it. It was a great hobby to have for, I don't know how long I did it for, you know, seven years or something but um two years ago i sold it uh actually to the people really? who make the fast and furious movies so i don't watch the fast and furious movies but if someone sees an old gray mercedes like driving off a cliff or something or getting completely totaled let me know because that's probably my old uh maybe yeah. the old you know the grease mobile well, but but you know now it's a lot easier to to drive electric for example back then it wasn't really a viable option now you can buy a used nissan leaf for like seven thousand dollars and it gets about you know maybe 60 or 70 miles on a charge so and and then you know i think the 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 really long range electric cars they're a little more expensive but i think they're gonna they're coming down fast and they're gonna keep coming down so um that was the hardest thing i did the other the other thing i did which is actually super easy I think anyone could do is just become vegetarian. Like you don't really have to eat meat or at least like cut out like 90% of the meat. It's really not that hard. Um, and that was the second biggest change that I made. And then the third thing was uh, riding my bike more. And that was pretty much it. Everything else, well, I, I guess the, the biggest one too that I should mention was just flying less. So if you can stay off airplanes, that's that's huge in terms of lifestyle. And then the reason I wrote my book being the change was because as I was doing this stuff, uh, I realized I liked it better. It was like a slower lifestyle. There was more community. I was at the community garden all the time. I was trading seeds and zucchinis with my neighbors all the yeah. time. I was waving at people and I bike past them. You know, I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't taking these trips. You know, um, being away every every month or two, leaving for like ten days to go to some. I you know, know. that was another something. thing I had commonality yeah. with you. I flew it was everywhere all the in my career. The jet lag. And you know what happened to me? I'd come back from a trip and I'd be sick for two weeks. I don't know what if it was just uh, when I go to these trips, I'd stay up really late. And, for, you know, I go out with like these people, these scientists that I didn't see except for a couple times a year. And we'd always kind of go out and stay out late and, you know, drink beers and and go to bed too late and yeah i don't know what if it was it was all of that stuff put together but i get sick for like two weeks Ooh. and i miss my family terribly and i couldn't yeah. get you can't really have a garden if you're doing all that traveling very well so no I, I just liked it better all this all these changes and that's why i wrote the book and then i you know the other the other big thing that's changed since then was that the reason I did all the lifestyle stuff was because there wasn't a whole lot of actual activism going on back then. Like the 2010, 2010, uh, 12 timescale, there was like 350.org, but yeah. there was no Extinction Rebellion. There was no Sunrise. It, you know, it was very, and, and even 350.org back then, it was very polite. It was like making climate art, you know, like, go, you know, you know, everyone lying down in the field so that a helicopter could come and like take a picture from overhead and we were oh spelling out 350 or so it wasn't <laughs> going to change anything um so that that was discouraging to me so i'm like what else could i do so that's why and now everything's different you know now i would say it, doing the lifestyle changes and reducing your emissions it's fantastic but don't necessarily even make that the focus i think you could have a lot more impact from getting politically engaged and being an activist and joining up with other climate activists and going to these group meetings and thinking more strategically about how can we pressure the politicians? How can we grow the movement? 
How can we get a billion climate activists involved? How can we get lawyers involved more? How can we get lawyers to switch from you know this kind of law into environmental law? There's a there's so you know, how can we get um, authors to write climate novels and television showrunners to make climate? So there's a million things. Whatever you do for your job, there's probably some way you can use that particular talent to be a climate activist. So the the lifestyle is important, but that kind of creativity and that kind of courageousness and pushing against the bounds of well, discourse, you know, maybe doing stuff that's not actually legal because what the fossil fuel industry is doing right now is perfectly legal and they're killing the planet, right? So yeah, if stopping yeah, that, if, that st if stopping that stuff means breaking some laws, as long as you're not how? hurting anyone, you know, have at it, but you're going to have consequences, right? And that stuff is more, all that stuff is, I think, a lot more, even more important than the lifestyle stuff which is still important and it makes you feel better, you know, but that's, it's reducing your own emissions isn't a solution. It's something that you no. can do to shift the culture. Yeah. It is something you can do just because it feels disgusting to burn fossil fuels. So you don't want to do it. So it makes you feel better. So th those are the two reasons to do it. Well, if it makes you feel better and, and you talk to people about how you're trying to live and how you're trying to change your life, sometimes it puts a spark in another person. One, two, exactly. we talk on this channel about rewilding a lot. And mm -hmm. I'm rewilding parts of my property. I have acreage and there's others of us that have acreage and we've all talked mm. about it. So it's little things like that, rewilding and Great. just seeing the, uh, the, 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 the honeybees, the bumblebees, the, the pollinators on the property. Those are all positive things. And the political is a huge challenge. Yeah, and go, going to your city council meetings to help you know, it's great to rewild on your property. It's also great to rewild within the community if there's like yeah. a common space or if they're going to bulldoze it and put up some kind of, you know, horrible development or something, or if you can get them to put in a more bike infrastructure or more community gardens. So you, you've got your level, you've got your family and friends, you've got your community groups, you've got your city councils and your county, and then you've got your state. And it just goes from there. And you can do stuff at every level and all like, interconnects and so i think people should fun. and i do even even if we feel that the long-term outcome is shit and we may not get to well, where we want to be there, we live shit. today there's shit and there's like completely horribly fucked right so yeah we want to keep things to the shit fucked. as much as we yes. can it's, yes. a, it's a sliding <laughs> scale it goes goes from here's zero climate change 30 years ago we could have had that pretty oh easily God. now we've got the beginnings of climate breakdown and we and it's going to get to at least this bad but we could keep it from getting this bad right that's the goal <laughs> yeah. so yeah no matter how bad it gets i really hope everyone keeps fighting as hard as they can <laughs> Me Absolutely. too. Me too. I can't get that one off. But I, uh, there was a somebody put up a quote from you that was good, but it's going fast in the chat. I can't find it. Well, <laughs> let's let's yeah. um, let's. Okay. So basically, on the right, we have seen this new shift for people going to school boards. And they are oh, yeah. trying to insinuate themselves in school boards. And that's another thing that climate activists could run for school boards and work yeah. trying to change the curriculum in schools oh, and yeah. not stopping. You know, there's just there's a million yeah. things to do. I like a million things to do. A, a million. A I like um, Margaret. Yeah. Uh, I like the climate mobilization a lot. And I'd love to bring them into my small town because Margaret they are Klein all. Solomon. Yes. Yes, she's great. Yes, I do. Yeah. Uh huh. And we we have a group in my you know little tiny Amish community, concerned citizens of Allegheny County, kind of on a hiatus because of the pandemic. But we kept things like uh, fracking brine from being used on the road. They were all, and we are all farms. They were using fracking brine in the winter and that shit was leaching out into farms. And we have some very talented people from Cornell who worked with us. So those are things that can be done. Robert Hoarth? Hoarth? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. He's, yes. he's yes. kind of a personal hero of mine. And if he's yes. watching, he should follow me back on Twitter. Anyway, I'll he's great. I'll send him uh, this. I will I learned a lot this. from his I learned a lot from his papers because uh, in my book I talk about methane leak leakage and I did some calculations about you know how much leakage of, of methane gas 
do you need to get to before it's even worse than coal, right? Because when I wrote my book and the 2015 timescale, one of the big, horrible, uh, distracting, damaging fossil fuel narratives was that methane gas is a bridge fuel, right? Oh, and, God, yeah. Yeah, Bob, Bob's done so much to push against yeah. that. You know, he's really yes. a great activist that way. And he was yeah. involved with that hideous thing they put up in New York State. The I, I, I don't remember. And, uh, just a, another ridiculous processing plant for the Pennsylvania frack. Frack Pennsylvania, but ship it to New York oh, to, get, to get, yeah. You know, when, when, when Biden was running in the primaries and he said that he wouldn't ban fracking, I was just like, oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> like, let's, we do need to ban that. It's horrible. We gotta, we gotta stop completely stopped the expansion of the fossil fuel industry. That's why, you know, when Bernie got, uh, when Bernie, when they coalesced and did their thing to stop Bernie and he had so much momentum and, you know, California, where I live, they, they didn't get fooled. You know, they voted for Bernie here in this beautiful state, uh, which is taking really a huge climate hit, right? This is oh great. California God, it's ground zero for climate change. But, um, you know, that's, that was the moment where I'm like, I don't know, I just it's not clear to me that electoral politics is going to do this. It's going to be fast no. enough because the Democratic Party, it's right? They put me. they put fossil fuel subsidies back into their official party platform, um, right? So so they took it out, and and so they they were like, I was like, great, they're going to ban subsidies, which is a no brainer. Like, why would we subsidize an why? industry that's literally killing us? Why would they give, give them, make it easier for them to kill us? It's crazy. And then they were like, oh, no, no, sorry, that was a mistake. We, we meant to leave that in. So the Democratic Party literally wants to keep supporting fossil fuel subsidies. Biden yeah. says he won't ban fracking. He says nothing will fundamentally change. He begs OPEC to increase production. I mean, what's it going to take to get actual uh, politicians we're willing to stand up to the industry that's literally killing our habitable planet. It's going to take their grandchildren. It's going to exactly. take their fucking grandchildren to tell them, wake up, pop. But I yeah. don't even know. I think greed is is a way a way more powerful full entity. And I think he, I think the, the movement just hasn't gotten quite strong enough yet. The, <sighs> the activist movement. So that's why I say we need a billion climate activists. We have to make it super cool. We have to make it super horrible to be a fossil fuel executive. We have to make it so no one wants to post their vacations, their their airplane trips on Instagram anymore because they're embarrassed. <laughs> you know, we, we have to make it so that fossil yes, fuel like that. doesn't have a social license anymore. I'm, I'm serious. And that it's You're super right. cool to live with less fossil fuel. It's super cool to tell the, the you know, the fossil fuel industry to go fuck itself. Like, that's what we need. We need... The, this industry to be painted as the bad guys that they are, right? And then the politicians will be like, oh, it's cool to like stand up to the fossil fuel industry. And they'll realize they can actually okay. make more, they could get more contributions by standing up than they ever got from the fossil fuel. So we haven't quite gotten to that social tipping point yet where um, it, it's better for them electorally. They're more likely to, to keep their jobs if they tell the fossil fuel industry to you know, to, to fuck off. Then fuck off, we can say it, we're not money. on any network. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we're close though. You know, Harvard yeah. just finally di divested a couple days ago. Yeah, I saw that, that was huge. I think huge. that's gonna start a cascade effect. Um, so it's it's happening. I, I wish it didn't take this long, but it's happening. I think they're, they're wobbling the, the industry. We just gotta push them harder so they go over the brink. And then I think things will start to change quite faster than we can imagine. That's my hope. Well, it's it's a it's a we have no choice. <laughs> you know, I'm never going to be one to sit back and just say, "Well, okay, let them use fracking, Brian." You know, I can't do that. I I was a I've been an activist, and I'm sure a lot of mm -hmm. my audience has been, so they they understand. But there's also the other the other side of the coin where you know sometimes people do get into the well. We're fucked. We are so fucked. Anyway, I guess we're going to go here that whatever we do is not going to matter. And I don't quite, I don't believe that it'll matter yeah, for today and tomorrow and next week. That's why XR is out there. Yeah, factually, it's just not true. Like I said before, there's like, there's a world of pain and there's like completely, totally like civilization ending fuck, 
fuckitude. Uh, we so and, and there's everything in between, right? So so it's just not true that there's no point to keep fighting now. We might as well give up. That's that. But emo- so that's not true. Emotionally, though, I have to respect their truth that they're feeling that, and it's valid to feel terrified right now. It's valid to feel despair. It's valid to feel anxiety. It's valid to feel grief. It's fa- valid to feel great anger and frustration. And right now, that's my overriding emotion. I've had different periods. But these are all valid feelings. I just hope that the people who say we're fucked, we should give up. Um, I, I understand that's how they feel. I, I just would urge, them to, I would urge them to keep it to themselves as much as they can and not try to convince other people to give up. And hopefully they can, I would encourage them to go to an XR meeting, to go to a Sunrise meeting, yeah. to get involved with some activist group or other to try to pull them out of that despair because right. frankly, it's just not a fun place to be. Um, I don't, the reason, one of the reasons I'm an activist and I do everything I can to fight against this is because it's more fun and it's better for my mental health. Yeah. Like if I was just lying on my couch being like, oh, we're fucked, I'm, I, there's nothing I no. can do. I would feel terrible. I would action you know, is I the just, antidote to despair. I mean, and an antidote. Even if it's Collective, in your own and, garden. <laughs> yeah. In the long term, I think collective action, you know, once governments actually start to do something, if we can push them or replace them, you know, with one way or another, whether it's pitchforks and you know, rising up and make you know, I don't know how bad it's gonna get, but one way or another, we need collective action, whether it's through these governments or something that comes after them, I'm not sure. Um, but once that starts to happen, I think it'll be, even though the fires and floods and storms, they will get worse. Oh. But if we start acting collectively, I think we'll come out of this despair in some way, because even though things are getting worse, we'll know we're going in the right direction and that'll make a huge difference for all of our kind of like hope and mental health and feeling like, you know, all right, that was, I hope in my lifetime, I, I'm pretty sure in my lifetime, unless I you know die early for some reason, uh, but you know, I'm middle-aged right now. So over the next like 40 years or so, we're definitely gonna go in one or two directions towards like complete ultimate, like we're so fucked, like that could, I don't, there's no guarantee that we don't make the wrong decisions to go down that route. That is a possibility, unfortunately. Well, look at but what there's also a possibility that 40 years from now, we've made all the right decisions and we're like, oh man, that, that was close. Things are better. You know, we've learned how to be on this planet. We've, we, I really think that to come out of climate breakdown, we're also gonna have to do things like figure out how to distribute wealth more fairly and how to stop being racist and how to stop fighting these pointless wars. Bingo, you know, bingo, and, bingo. <laughs> yeah, we. I, I do think it's all connected. We don't really have time to go into exactly why, but it, no. it has to do with the colonizing mindset and the capitalist mindset and enclosing for profit and hoarding everything toward yourself and telling yeah. everyone else they can, they can fuck off even though I've got like, you know, $400 billion. I'm going to like go to make a spaceship company and go to space <laughs> instead of you know helping my fellow humans right that right. that whole thing has to end otherwise i don't think we're going to come out of this robert lloyd said a comfortable privileged ignorant population will not rebel especially with pitchforks of course the pain is coming of that i'm sure well but that that's not all of them robert but and once, i know and it's a lot the pain the 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 pain is like a rising tide that's starting to take more and more people into it. And that's when you're right. The pitchforks don't come out when everyone still has their Netflix and their, you know, yeah. uh, McDonald's or whatever. But uh, when, when you, you really feel the pain and you, you're starting to go hungry and you don't have health care and you lose everything, then yeah, they start to come out. So, and there are a lot of people that, um, you know, are, are experiencing that all over the world. You know, the United yeah. States, when some people experience something horrible, it's about 20 times worse in another country. But I, I want to ask you a question in that vein. When other countries say they want to get to the Western lifestyle, they want to have the material things. They want, like in Brazil, that's why the, the, the rainforest is coming down. Well, how, do we act, how do we respond and say, to those people, listen, it's not so great. Um, we can't do this. You're never going to get a taste of what we've had. That's yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a really, really good question. Um, you know, I think that 
first of all, you know, we we have to do what we can within our borders first. So we so that's called leading by example. And we can't say like, oh, Brazil's cutting down the rainforest, China's building more coal plants. So we're just not gonna do anything either, right? Uh -huh. That's complete bullshit. So first of all, we have to lead by example and do what we can within our borders. Otherwise, we have no moral authority whatsoever to tell any other country what they should do, right? And then second, we have to build in to our climate plans and we basically don't have climate plans. The Green New Deal is basically a plan to build renewables and you know create more jobs. And there's no political risk to that whatsoever. Once we end fossil fuel subsidies and once we have a moratorium on expansion of the fossil fuel industry, then we'll know that politicians are finally starting to get serious. Then once we have an, a year by year, like by 2022, we have to be this down to here, by 2023 down to here, and here's how we're gonna do that. So if we have like a plan to get to zero, not net zero, but say to zero by 2035, that's how you'll know that things things are starting to get real. They're not, they haven't gotten real yet. And, and part and parcel with that kind of an actual plan is a plan for helping nations that historically haven't created these emissions that we've created and, and are bearing the brunt of the pain. So we, we a huge part of it has to be helping them you know, build their energy infrastructure without fossil fuels and, you know, basically probably, frankly, paying them to not cut down their rainforest, right? I think that has to be a part of it. It's going to be a really hard discussion. But yeah, it's, it's, I agree. It's really hard to see how we do this. We're like a primitive species with these borders. Like we have these national borders, climate breakdown, uh, ecological breakdown, biodiversity loss, six extinction that doesn't give a shit about our national boundaries and so somehow we have these national boundaries are keeping us from preserving the very planet that gave our, our us life and yeah that's a very hard one it's like you know i wish we were more advanced socially at this point because it, it's yes. going to be a huge impediment to deal with this these these national boundaries and all the bristling militaries and the this like oh like we've got ours here we're going to close our border i mean just think about the climate refugees that are coming uh, up from the global south imagine a billion people trying to get into europe trying to get into the us and canada trying to get into finland and norway and sweden and russia it's just gonna i we just don't have the political uh sophistication the the, the social sophistication to deal with that. So I'm very concerned about the geopolitics of that. Peter, uh, sorry to as, go dark as, there. No, it, you're not dark. Let's, we're, let's, we're all Sandy, dark let's, here. let's go till 40 after. Let's take another 12 minutes. Okay. Okay. I, I want to yeah. ask you, uh, on, and now I don't want to lose what I, I had. <laughs> I got a, a little sidetracked. The chat's going a million miles an hour. Um, let's see. You have to have a way to pause it, right? So you, you no, can like, I, get, I, get the questions. No. Well, um, let me see. Okay. So um, question. We we will do this question and maybe I'll think about what it was that I that fleeted right off my head. Should academics be providing climate presentation to other professors and, yeah. and encouraging a universal strike? Yes, they should. They should be doing both of those things. Next question. <laughs> okay next question i, I told i told um, sandy everyone that i was going to try to answer questions as quickly as i could so we could do more of them right and okay here let's see yeah. uh yeah we got to get out of these Peter, comfortable if silos that's true that the, is the amount of methane we would never have in a comfortable silence with you and me i'm sorry okay yeah. so uh is the amount of oh, methane 10 times the amount of carbon yeah uh so, you know, methane, um, which is the main component of fossil gas, otherwise known as natural gas, it's 90% plus methane. And a lot of it leaks out under the streets when it gets to your house, yeah. uh, from the wells, from the wellheads, from, from the refineries uh, when it gets transported. So it's a really messy, horrible process. Um, and if like, I think like three or 4% of it leaks and most estimates have it higher than that, then it's even worse than coal. Because yeah, on like a, I think a, a 20 year time scale, it's something like 80 times uh, has more climate impact in terms of the warming potential than CO2 does. And then in the atmosphere after roughly 10 years or so, it degrades into CO2. So it basically oxidizes. Uh, with the oxygen, the, C the CH4 turns into CO2. But yeah, in terms of how much is going to be released, like from ocean uh, methane and the Arctic, 
the Arctic. And from, yeah, and from the permafrost and the artist, which, our Arctic, which is melting. Uh, I think the uncertainty on that is incredibly high. Um, and even though it's, it's so, such a strong initial climate impact, the fact that it turns into CO2 after about 10 years means that the main long-term effect from any methane that's released will just be like, it'll bump up the total amount of CO2 by a certain amount. But yeah, I think there's still really big error bars. One thing that keeps me up at night, you know, when, when I was writing my book, I was, I was reading about the carbon cycle and, and methane release. And a lot of the experts in that field were like, oh, don't worry about it too much. You know, David Archer, other people. And I was like, do they really know? Or are, could they be wrong, right? And, you know, I, no, no one predicted the heat dome in the Pacific Northwest. And I don't think anyone predicted the levels of, uh, of precipitation that we're getting now. So the climate models, they're really good at predicting the long-term mean warming for the whole planet at a certain level of, you know, greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. But maybe they're not good at predicting these like really much more complicated, interconnected, regional, short term, the, these things that kind of like fly under the radar of the climate models, which have these, you know, 100 kilometer grid cells, right? So the climate models are still pretty coarse because they're computationally intense and they're leaving out some of the processes, some of the physical processes that we don't understand very well. If you don't understand the physics very well, you just kind of leave it out of the model, right? And I think what's what we're finding maybe not surprisingly, is that all of those biases in the models lead to them underestimating the actual impacts that we're starting to experience now. So yeah, that, that's something that keeps me up at night. So that was Did a long Did the IPCC answer. underestimate in, in some of the report? Well, there's some things that have been underestimated, things like, you know, Arctic uh, sea ice loss, um, uh, Greenland and Antarctic ice sheet loss has been just historically underestimated over the decades. The estimates are starting to get better now. The models are starting to get better. But yeah, it was really uh, the, the the heat dome, that that level of extreme heat that far north was a really big wake up call for the climate community. Oh my God, and the rain in Greenland? That's insanity. The rain in Greenland was crazy. Mount Shasta not having any snow anymore is crazy for me. You know, driving past Mount, I never climbed up Mount Shasta, but it's just like everywhere you look, the coral reefs are dying pretty fast. I study that, uh, you know, just hiking in the Sierra Nevada, one of my favorite places. Um, we were there in June and it was dry. We usually go in August, uh, months later so we were we were really early in the season in june and there was like no snow left on the passes we were on like mather pass glen pass they were snow free it was crazy never seen them snow free and it was june and then the other thing that was really disturbing was there are just dead and dying trees everywhere the you know the lodgepole pines mainly where we were at just i never seen so many brown trees in the high sierras before and i just been there three years earlier uh my, my wife and my kids and i wa walked almost the whole john muir trail and there was no there was no inkling of tree mortality just three years ago so it's happening so fast and it's happening wherever you look it's just what's it going to take to get these frankly pardon my french these fucking politicians to do what we pay them to do like, why are they serving the fossil well, fuel industry? I don't think, I, 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 I try, Peter, but, you know, I really try to say that we this is going to change. Yeah. And I, well, I keep my my um, uh, wits about me at times. Well, but... we, we're doing our best. I'm glad more people are starting to accept that it's a climate emergency. The thing that gets me the most, it's not the deniers that, like, they try to attack me and I just block them or whatever. My it's show the, the other night was on them. <laughs> it's, it's the, like, kind of, like, liberals and the climate activists who tell me that I'm being too extreme and I should talk to a therapist. You know, like, oh, wow. Fuck, fuck that. That's not going to no. solve this problem. No, it's and, not. And by the way, I'm doing fine. Like, I, I look at this full in the face day in and day out, and I have my own ways of dealing with it. You know, I, I, I wouldn't, you know, I, I was depressed 
when I was a young, not because of climate change, but just for other reasons. So I experienced a couple of years of depression when I was in college. I know what it's like. I'm not depressed at all now. I deal with my anxiety. But Maine, it's, it's a, it is a intense emotionally to be looking at this all the time. And I will tell you, therapy isn't going to help me or anyone else who's feeling these emotions. The only thing that will help is when we get the kind of collective action and the political action that we need. That's the only thing that's going to help us. And so. I, I believe that even if it it's a, a it could be a joke, but I believe next, it. Next All right, question. Let's go to this. Yeah. Does Peter have a dad named Peter? <laughs> no, <laughs> my dad's name Christopher. Okay. Uh, next question. Hi, that was an easy one. Yeah, That's probably the real... easiest question I've ever asked. <laughs> there are uh, oil reserves in parts of Africa that would dwarf all that America said. Good thing it lies under conflict countries. Yeah, I don't know about where the big deposits are. You know, I know there's still a lot in Venezuela. Uh, I know that there's enough oil and fossil gas and coal to basically destroy the planet a few times over. Interestingly, just a few years ago, there was a, there was a big um, kind of community called the peak oil community. And mm -hmm. their whole thing was like, oh, oh yeah. my God, it's not climate change we should worry about. It's like, we're gonna run out of oil and fossil fuels. And, and then we're gonna have like huge economic downturns. And it's, it's gonna be like social destabilization. And boy, were they wrong. <laughs> uh, there's, there's plenty of oil, ga uh, fossil gas, and coal. The problem is climate and ecological breakdown. Okay, next question. Yeah, it sure Activism is. Activism therapy. Okay. Yeah, help. Activism helps. <laughs> okay. Um, I want to get to avoid. Activism. Uh, you're not alone with these emotions. No. When you're doing activism, you're with other people who are like-minded. Oh, and that I makes a huge it. difference. I think I it's lost the question. It's going too fast for you, Sandy. No, and you. All right, I'm gonna throw up. Oh no, I'm gonna get them. I'm gonna get it back. We had one that was. Uh, when do you think the blue ocean event's gonna happen? That was. Uh, what's the blue ocean event? Sorry, that I don't even know is, what that is when the Arctic goes blue for oh. the length of time that it. Yeah, here it is. Oh, you mean Question. you don't have you have an ice free summer? Yeah. Oh yeah, I don't know, Paul but it's Beck funny with because Paul's at the Blue Ocean event. I, I a couple of years ago, I was at the AGU meeting in San Francisco, the American Geophysical Union, which is like thirty thousand Earth scientists. You know, half of them are two thirds of them are climate scientists. They all get together and have their big academic conference every year. And I went to a session that was on Arctic ice melt, and they were showing you know historical melt and extrapolations. Mm -hmm. And oh man, and, and after one speaker was kind of dancing around that question. Uh, just asked her directly when when's it going to be ice free and she wouldn't answer me um so i and i'm not an expert in that area i don't know but um it is declining fast i will say that definitely i would say definitely before uh, 2050 but it depends a little bit because like you're going to have a little bit of ice close to some of the coasts so it depends on exactly where you how you define it uh, all right next question all right then we're then that's not pretty Go ahead and read. I Could that. all Here's this my... carbon and methane actually make the air poison? No. The thing that makes the air poison the most is actually, it does come from burning fossil fuels, but it's not the CO2 and the methane. It's it's mainly the, uh, the particulates. So what they call like, you know, PM 2.5, these like 2.5 micron. You look at them, they're little, they come from burning like diesel, for example. And you look at them under the microscope, you could Google it like a, a micro you know, a uh, microscope image of PM 2.5. It's these like tiny little carbon uh, ash things and they lodge in your lungs and they make you sick. And they yeah. give you cancer and they yeah. take away like years of your life sometimes. So if you go Google like, you know, air pollution, public health, it's a, it's a huge global public health emergency that we hardly ever talk about, but it's not, it's it's indirectly related to climate change because that you know black carbon in the atmosphere can make the atmosphere warm to some extent. It can go on snow and ice and make the snow and ice melt faster. But that's the worst thing for public. And then ozone also, uh, which is caused especially on a hot day, the combination of a hot day and you know exhaust from cars and whatnot creates low level ozone, which is really bad for public health too. But you know if you're in a room and you have too much CO2 in the room, uh, it can have effects on you but it's going to take it's 
there, there's a lot more things to worry about first before we get to levels of CO2 that actually like hurt us. So, okay. Yeah. All right. Next, we are going to. This is the last uh, one. Oh, okay. That's right. You're on a time limit. Will Dr. Yeah. Kama support solar radiation management frameworks like MIR reflection since we are losing the albedo from ice melt and losing aerosols? Oh, yeah. I, so good question. Um, I'm not sure what mirror reflection is, but the, the most basic form of solar radiation management is you just fly airplanes as high as you can and you emit sulfates and these little aerosol particles. This is the mirror reflect. project. It's a mirror project. Okay, that's project. what I'm describing. All that's right. What, well, um, that's what they... it it scares the shit out of me um, because it's here's the problem with it. It's probably going to happen. I would say it's more likely than not just the way politicians work. They want a quick fix. Right. Um, and things are going to start getting unbearably hot over the next few years and especially over the next few decades. And they probably will turn to this as a last resort. The, the problem is the fossil fuel industry and the politicians, they're going to use it as an excuse, either directly or just indirectly by reducing urgency to keep emitting, to keep burning fossil fuels. Um, and then you're going to get warfare, you're going to get famines, even with the solar radiation management, you're going to start getting social breakdown. And it might get hard to keep doing it year after year. As soon as you stop flying those planes, uh, you're going to, in a very short amount of time, a matter of months or years, you're going to get a, a very sharp spike in global temperatures and a very sudden increase in the fires and the flooding and the storms uh, oh, in all of the God. impacts that we're seeing. So that's that's like a, you know, that's the nightmare scenario is a combination of solar radiation management with um increased as an excuse for procrastination, followed by geopolitical destabilization or economic collapse, and then a, a cessation of the solar radiation management. So I think it's a terrible idea. But unfortunately, totally. the way humans work and human psych psychology and human politicians, it seems <laughs> more likely. And if you read the Ministry for the Future, the new novel by Kim Stanley Robinson, I encourage everyone to at least read the first chapter. Okay. Um, you know, that that the first chapter describes uh, just a nightmare scenario of a humid heat wave event in India where you know I think hundreds of thousands of people die and India is like you know fuck this we're just going to do solar radiation management on our own because the world's you know we didn't oh. cause this problem and we're getting fried because of it and so and a single country could do that and no one would so I do think unfortunately it is going to happen and I hope that the climate movement gets strong enough that we can destroy the fossil fuel industry despite having the solar radiation management. All right, like and on that, that dark note, we should probably end. Be a well, climate Mike, activist, Mike everyone. people don't think you're so dark. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 I would personally love to see the fossil fuel industry destroyed. We, we got to take them out. They're killing us. It's life. For, it's really life or death, people. Well, it's We got to take them yeah. out. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. I really hope you come back because there are more. It, it, it was fascinating, and I had I had more things I would have liked to discuss. We could um, talk for hours, Sandy. It was you are a very good interviewer, and thank you for the great <laughs> questions, and thank you for everything you do. Oh, thank so, you, everybody! Don't leave right. yet. Peter, say goodbye, and then uh, we'll have a little chit chat before All I right. end. Bye, Peter. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so we, very we are, much. We need a billion climate activists. Get out there and uh, <laughs> make make good trouble, everyone. Okay, bye. Bye, Peter. Bye. All right, guys. Well, I thought that was great. I like Peter, and I know that uh, there has been a lot in the chat, um, but you know, XR's out there trying to do things and they just had their, what, two weeks almost of activism. You know, you're going to die if you don't try. I know you're going to die anyway, but there you go. That That's how I felt. So does anybody have anything else that they would like to uh, talk about? <laughs> I don't think Peter's been arrested. Void asked the question. He's gone. He um, He's working. <laughs> you know, he's working at, um, he is a modeler and a data scientist with uh, NASA Jet Propulsion Lab. So he's out there. He's in the world working, calculating, giving us, um, giving us 
data for records. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Chuck says. Thanks, Peter. So, guys, um, I want to thank you for coming. I like the show. I'm always enthusiastic about activism. I didn't get to ask him about Max Wilbert and uh, Thacker Pass and the lithium protest, which to me is a big thing also because uh, th that's destroying a, a habitat to build a big hideous lithium mine. So maybe I could do that with Peter again. I really um, enjoyed having him. And see, you're right, you know, I guess those of us that have kids, even though my daughter's older, the hell that she's going to live through in 20 years when she's not even my age yet, I don't even like to think about it. And I, and unfortunately, it's going to happen. And there are a lot of us that just want to make some kind of little difference. And I'm still in that camp. You can call me a doomer or not. You know, you can call me a doomer or not. I don't particularly think the long-term outcome is rosy or bright but i'll die trying there you go <laughs> and hello there sam <laughs> you know how i feel anyway listen guys thank you very much i um appreciate all of you uh thank you again to everyone that um has done their uh, participated in our buy me a coffee it helps because truthfully I look and I see that the subscriptions come out and I'm, I'm so grateful, you know. I didn't even get to go talk about it with Peter. We had earlier talked about the weather patterns and why the hell it's happening like it is here, you know, that's making my life miserable and making me have to pretty much uh, sell everything to fix my basement walls because they're falling in. <laughs> yeah, well, he has a career, okay. And you thought he was laid back. He just came in from um, running, actually. And uh, I think he's very cool. I hope he comes back again. We do have, um, let me shut this thing off. We do have, let me look at my calendar, guys, and I will tell you the next. We have an, ex oh, we have something Friday night. We have a rollout of something exciting that I will be getting to you. And, uh. It's something Jennifer's been working on with a new person that came into our uh, lives from Germany. And this is going to be really, really interesting for you guys. Uh, any of you that understand German and can speak German definitely um, will like this. And then we have Dar Jamel on Wednesday the 22nd will be with me. And I really look forward to that. It's been Four years in the making of that one. Okay, and what 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 point am I missing, Dick? I was missing a point. All right, well, if I was missing a point, it was just something that maybe I was meant to miss. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Oh, I, I'm, I'm missing the reason why he came. Well, he has an article in The Guardian, and I've been asking him for a long time. So... That was, oh, yes, he wants us to organize. Well, why not? That's okay. All right, that point is great. I'm, I'm trying to bring the climate mobilization into my little town because it's a perfect organization to fit with what our needs are here if the shit hits the fan. Community is what it's about, and nobody can argue. Nobody can argue that community is not what it's about because that, that what do you think that bugs in a jar farm is? What is my place? What is what we're, we're doing? You know, all right. Say what you want about hopium. He's got kids. I have a 32 year old daughter. It's not hopium that I have. I just don't want her to live through a shit show that she's going to live through anyway. What am I going to say? There's a kid that wants to move to LA. She's out of her mind. Oh, Jean, thank you for coming. Karen, yep, a billion of us. Could we do it? Could we do it? What do you think? Could we do it? A billion? I don't know. I don't know, guys. <laughs> well, listen, I love you all. Thank you. Don't forget that... Um, yeah, Dick. Okay. Hope. Well, hope it's, it's, it depends on who you are. You know, a lot of us are in pain anyway. 
But um, yes, Poppy, community's good. It's beautiful. It is. And I'm not, I don't have my head up my ass or my, or my head in the clouds. I am firmly planted in what, what, what shit show we are in. Firmly planted cleaning my basement three times a day. And yeah, Rebecca, stop buying crap. Uh, yes, I'm selling everything possible I can sell. Everybody knows that. And that was an interesting thing for me to see Peter. They live, a, you know, a very modest like lifestyle. And a lot of people aspire to, and that's the problem. A lot of people aspire to have and have and want and want. It's still happening. If you have network TV, if you watch HGTV, I say this over and over again, they set the people up and, and house hunters to say, oh, no, I absolutely have to have a gas stove. You know, it's all a manipulation. It's all manufactured consent and it's all bullshit. So maybe we should get a billion people to mobilize. What is wrong with that? nothing see you say that uh, okay are going to do together is fight to survive in the coming mad max well maybe there'll be a billion people that might get might be able to get the most choice deer <laughs> uh john climate awareness is growing thanks to people like me well thank you i hope so i hope so all right, guys, I'm uh, it, it, it's 50 minutes. Thank you so much for coming. I really did. You know what? You're right. It's never doubt that a, a small group of thoughtful citizens could change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has Margaret Mead. And even if it just changes to make somebody, you know, a little lives around the world um, a little bit, a little bit better. There you go. There you go. All right, guys. We will see you Friday. Look out for all of the information to come out tomorrow. Um, love you. <laughs>